Welcome to Voice of Supply Chain brought to you by ISM New Jersey and Source Day. The purpose of our show is to tell stories of people in procurement and supply chain doing extraordinary things. I'm your show host, Sarah Scudder. I oversee marketing at Source Day. I should be in a green wig today and a green outfit, but we've got an off-site company event that I snuck out for. So wig to come for future shows. We automate purchase order changes and enable supplier collaboration for manufacturers, distributors, CPG brands, and retailers. If you ever want to talk more about women in ERP or what's happening in the manufacturing world, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. And you can also follow my two hashtags, women in ERP and manufacturing maven. Today, our guest is Melissa Drew. I think, Melissa, you and I have known each other for at least 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. I know we met at a conference many, many, many years ago, so it's been awesome to follow your journey. For those who are joining us live, this show is meant to be interactive, so do not feel um, shy at all to put a note in the comments for Melissa, give us a shout out. I'd like to start off by having you tell us where in the world you are joining us from, and maybe a word to describe how your week is going so far. So Melissa, we're, this is a show where it's going to be podcast style. We're going to just jump right into the Q&A. Okay. So I, I want to start with your college years. So we're mm -hmm. going gonna to flash back, go down memory lane a little bit. And I, I want to know why you chose to major in management information systems. You know, it's, it's funny because that wasn't my original intent. I, I wanted to be a computer engineering degree. I, I happened to, to go into one of those pubs, you know, so I, I was on Auburn, I was at Auburn University, um, which I believe you also are Auburn University, right? I am not. I'm Sonoma no. State. Sonoma State. Okay. So Coast I'm State. Auburn University, <laughs> SEC. Yep. And, um, I walked into one of the, the local pubs and there was this woman there and she was in computer engineering. And it was the only time I had ever talked to a woman who was in computer and science and technology. And she was beautiful and tall. And, you know, for me, I thought she was glamorous. I'm like, wow, I, I want to do this. I can do this. So I, I started my, my career, my degree in computer engineering until I got to the part where we had to program in Fortran. And we had to use mainframes and I couldn't understand the value of how I was going to be able to use that in the real world, nor could anybody, you know, explain it to me. And at that point I was like, ah, this isn't, this isn't the right thing for me. So I, I, you know, walked around campus and found the college of business. And there was this new degree first year that it came out called management information systems. And it was a collection of really combining the computer and the technology aspects, you know, telecom, computers, there was programming languages, but they were web-based programming, but it also combined with business. And that that was the perfect fit. So I ended up getting a degree in management information systems. <laughs> what was the most important thing you learned during college? Uh, wow. The most important thing that I learned during college That's a really good question. I don't know if I've reflected a lot about that. Uh, college, college, I think, was the first time I, I realized I was a computer nerd. I, I remember, you know, and, and again, we're talking a really long time ago. So if you wanted to be in computers or technology, you couldn't just go buy a computer. Back then, it was cheaper to buy the components and build yourself a computer. And that's exactly what I had to do is I built my computer, which, by the way, my mom told me that she still has that original computer in her closet that I built in college. Um, but is at that point, I think I truly understood that this was the right fit because I, I recall um, a funny story because we all like stories, a funny story. I had a date that night and I went to the computer lab. You know, you had to sign in, you had to wait your turn. I went on the computer lab. I did some computer work. And I completely lost track of time. And it was the first time that I'd ever gotten so engrossed in something that time just completely slipped away. And at 11 o'clock at night, this guy comes and taps me on the shoulder. And he's like, you know, we were supposed to go to dinner tonight. <gasps> oh, my gosh, I completely forgot. And 
But it was at that point that I knew that I'd found the right thing, that this was what I was passionate about. And, and it's pretty much what I've stayed in and evolved over the, you know, the last 27 years. <laughs> what did you think you wanted to do after graduation? Uh, my mom wanted me to be a doctor. She, she gave me this list and said, here are all the things that as a woman, you can make a lot of money in lawyer, doctor. So these are all the things that you should do. And, you know, as we just mentioned earlier, I went completely different, you know, opposite direction. Um, never did really good in the, the doctor, you know, medical chemistry classes, couldn't get through organic chemistry. So I stayed within that computer. But one of the things I never thought that I would ever do was be a programmer. I, I remember sitting in class and, you know, the teacher was just towards the end of our degree and there's, you know, 37 kids in class and the teacher says, how many of you want to be a programmer when you walk out of here? And 99% of the class raised their hand. I was the only one that did not raise their hand. I didn't want to be a programmer. I didn't want to sit behind a computer all day and be a programmer. And sure enough, as soon as I left college, I connected with one of those uh, traveling contractors and I ended up traveling around and I was a SQL programmer and building SQL triggers and working with data. Um, in fact, that was my first interaction with data, working with a lot of client data and, and really bumping into the fact that data really, you know, foundationally what we thought we knew about data was not how it was working in, in the real world. Yeah. Why do you think you've been so attracted to data throughout your career? When I, when I, I worked, so I left my bachelor's degree and I, I worked out in the real world for a year and I recognized that data, data, there was data had a lot more power than I think we, we all really understood. And I was seeing that as my job collecting the data from some of these clients and collecting the data from these different silo divisions and from, you know, globally and pulling them together that these companies were making really, really important decisions that were changing the trajectory of their companies and changing whether or not they were going to merge or acquire. I mean, these were major decisions that were being made by some of the data that we collected. So I decided to go back and, and get my master's degree and I focused on data, um, specifically what the future of data and, and how, how we could collect data, but but pull it together in a way that we could easily transform it and get it back out to make better informed decisions. But I think it was, it was then that I realized that data was way more important than, than we all thought it was. And I think we're still just now recognizing that within these last couple of years. Was you mentioned you went back to school because mm -hmm. you had this passion and realization about how important data is. You went back and got a master's in it. Mm -hmm. Was getting an MBA worth it? I think so. For, for, me, for me, I, I, it's funny. I, I think I, I ask a similar question sometimes to folks and, and I think that answer is very different. Not everybody likes to learn. Everybody likes to learn differently. And, and I really liked learning and absorbing knowledge and going back and, and going back to that MBA program or that master's program, dive deeper into an area that I wanted to learn more about. So I had a really great group of, of professors. Um, I was able to get federal grant money and I developed this first publicly used electronic database that collected data through the web, pulled it into a database, and then we were able to transform it into a way that enabled the Alabama apparel and textile company to make decisions about suppliers. And, and back then, what I didn't know is that I had developed the first electronic RFX, RFI, where we collected supplier information on the web, pushed it back into a backend database. And um, that was really the first interaction that I had with procurement supply chain. So if I hadn't gone back and got my master's, I don't think I would have gotten so heavily involved in data throughout the rest of my career but I also don't think I would have been truly um, introduced uh, to the value of procurement supply chain and, until that, that grant money that I got. So expand a little bit on how you got into procurement. So from, from there, 
um, I decided I'm going to go back and, and work in the real world. Um, I'd worked with data. I had built out these ERFXs and it caught the attention of back then it was called AT Kearney, but, but nowadays it's, it's known as Kearney and it caught the attention of Kearney. Kearney was really interested and had an entire department called the, the man, the data management group. And they were looking to develop these types of electronic ways to capture supplier information. So it, it caught their attention and I ended up uh, working as a manager uh, at Kearney for about four years, specifically within that, that data management group focused on what, what I now understand is procurement supply chain, going out and working with clients, building these electronic databases to collect supplier information so that these companies could make better informed decisions. And then from there, I just stayed within or always evolved around procurement supply chain. What do you think, I, I have a feeling we'll be chatting about data quite a bit. <laughs> it's is, the heart of the organization. <laughs> like, Susan Walsh, the classification guru would be happy to hear you saying this right yeah. now. What do you think, so you, you were at Kearney and you were focused on data back then, what was the biggest miss that companies were experiencing or, or facing around data? Well, one of the biggest challenge was, was infrastructure, not being able to, to contain it in a way that we could turn around and, and report on it. Um, so I think part of the miss was the technology wasn't there to support the the really the foundational layers. Um, I I don't think companies really understood the importance of data. I don't think they understood the power of data at that point. Um, there were a lot of people focused in marketing and sales and and decisions were being made very quickly. And it's okay to make quick decisions. It's okay to make decisions if you have 80% of the data. You certainly cannot get 100% of the data to make to make you know clear decisions, but in the you know and this is the late 1900s, early you know 2000, where now we're around you know 2005. We were just coming into the this aha moment that data was important, but n other than the government, nobody was really focused on it. Like I had friends who were in the government that were working on multi terabytes of data. And yet in the commercial sector where I was working, um, we, we were still, we're, we were still working with these smaller sets of data, you know, very, very specific to, Hey, what did you buy? And, and what did you spend? And, but what about all these other components to making a decision? So back then nobody realized that in order to make a really well-informed decision, you need to have more than just this little piece of data. You need to have, different perspectives and different variables and the diversity of data certainly wasn't there at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you started out at Kearney and mm -hmm. you've had a pretty interesting career. So I'd love to have you walk <laughs> me through your career progression. So what happened after Kearney through where you are today? So uh, Kearney got laid off because of 9-11. Uh, I was flying back. I uh, I'd actually was on a project and lived in Australia for a year. And uh, as uh, well, I was in Australia during 9-11, and when I flew back, back in the U.S., you know, after 9-11, the, the focus of disposable income wasn't really in procurement supply chain. It, it shifted, you know, into security and, um, and other areas. So not a lot of need for consultants in procurement supply chain at that time. So I, I started uh, working with some startups, some some patent pending companies. Um, I then decided that you know I'm gonna go be my own boss. I had I'd been my boss at one point in in college. It was actually the way I was able to pay pay for college, um, utilizing databases and going out and to the local, you know the local businesses. I would build databases and and help them do the same thing that I was you know learning about in school. And that paid for college, and I realized that there's this there's this excitement and energy and um, adrenaline that you get as an entrepreneur. And so I spent a long time, you know, over probably the course of four or five years, building out my own company and my own practice and my own brand. 
And, um, and off and on throughout my career, I've either been in consulting or I've, I've had my own company. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things that you've done throughout your career is managed people mm -hmm. and teams. Yes. What is the hardest decision you made being a boss and what did you learn from it? There was, there was this one, and it stands out mostly because usually when you, you work as a team, you know, you've got folks that just really want to be there and folks that don't. But, you know, there was this one individual who really wanted to be there, but the performance and the productivity wasn't there. And it wasn't that it just impacted him, it, it, it you know, it impacted the team. And, you know, you, you get HR and everybody comes in and everybody has their own perspective of what's going on and, oh, he needs to do X, Y, and Z, or, hey, why don't we put you and him in a, in a conference room and we'll have HR listen to you and make sure you are asking the right questions and make sure you are doing the right thing. And I, what I learned with that experience is it, it wasn't about me. And um, so I, I came up with what I thought was a bold idea at the time. And I said, you know, let's just, you and I go out to dinner. Um, let's, you know, public place, very well lit, but let's go out to dinner and let's just have a conversation. And over the course of about two hours after talking and, and diving deeper and kind of like what we call now a root cause analysis, you just keep asking why. And after a while, we kind of came up with this, this, you know, idea, consulting is just, you're not right for the consulting. I mean, you're brilliant and you have a lot of knowledge and, and you're good at what you do, but the the consulting framework and the fast pace and the constant change wasn't the right fit for this individual so it was kind of like this mutually agreed i'm firing you but you need to quit kind of thing which was really unusual you know feeling for me but it helped me recognize that that for the first time as a manager, being a manager wasn't about making sure that the deliverables for the client was the right thing or that everybody's work product, you know, had the highest amount of quality. It was the first time I started using the term, I need to set you up for success. You know, I want to set you up for success. I don't want to set you up to fail. And I think what we had done is inadvertently, we had set him up to fail, not realizing that what he needed was something that we couldn't give him. And ultimately what we discovered is consulting wasn't the right fit. And I still talk to this individual and he moved on and he moved into the public sector and he's been extremely happy and productive and flourished and it was the right thing to do. But we both learned a lot that, that night. So you've spent quite a bit of your career doing consulting. Mm -hmm. Why, what, what do you like most about consulting? Let's start there. I, I've tried both. I've, I've, well, I've done a lot of things. I've been the entrepreneur, I've been in consulting. And then I've also, I have worked in industry. I was, I was uh, at Avon. I was director of procurement at, you know, Estee Lauder. I, I did do and <laughs> work in, in the real organizations, but I found that I kept hitting these ceilings. I, I would work in them and I would want to expand my responsibilities and I would want to do more. And either A, I'd have to be creative and try to come up with a title of, you know, special projects, which would allow me to constantly do different things in the organization. Or I had one individual tell me, hey, that's not your job, that's your boss's job. So you just need to kind of stay in your box. And when I heard I just need to stay in my box, that's when I realized maybe working at this point in my life, you know, um, maybe this isn't either not the right company or, or not the right fit. So I went back into consulting and what I liked most about it was the, the change. You know, you, yes, you have a foundational set of knowledge and skills, but then you go to this client and this client has a new set of challenges, a different type of culture. Um, there was always this constant feeling of learning and I've come to realize throughout my career that that's what I thrive on. I thrive on constantly learning and adjusting and shifting, um, which I think is why I'm, I'm still fairly good at what I do now. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> what do you think are the three most important skills you possess that make you a great leader in technology? And mm -hmm. maybe talk a little bit about what you do in the tech space, because I know that's pretty broad in general, but you've done a lot of different things in tech that I think are important. Um, well, let's split that up into, into two different two different paths. Um, if I look at the technology side, um, as we know, I started in data and then data turned into procurement and supply chain. And then um, suddenly I became, um, I had an expertise in uh, procurement technology because now procurement technology was shifting into the cloud. So we're learning about the cloud and procurement technology. And, and then as I'm building these pillars and I'm weaving around procurement supply chain, I'm also now becoming, you know, an expertise in supplier diversity and spent a lot of my career developing supplier diversity programs and enhancing programs. Um, and then again, as I'm evolving around, you know, the procurement supply chain, it's, you know, risk and, you know, all these other things that keep coming. And I think that's what's made me stay relevant. So I would I would use the term relevant is is one of those words. Um, and then the other side of this is is teams, you know, working, you know, in person with teams and understanding what the individual needs and recognizing um, that as you shift from in person teams to virtual teams that individuals needs are different. And so I go back to, you know, in order to set up somebody for success, there's a whole host of things and variables that come with that. What does that person need to be successful? What do I need from that person for me to be successful? And I think that was the other part of this is just because I'm a manager and I'm managing the teams, they're also there to support and help me. So I also have to set up myself for success um, and recognizing that we're all working together. So collaboration would, would be that, that, second, that second word. And then the, the third part of this, I would say is self-awareness. Um, specifically because I've learned in order to be a good person in, in today's world, whether you're in technology, procurement, supply chain processes, whatever you're working in, it's, there's a lot of things that you hear, oh, a good consultant or a good person can, you know, has empathy or a good person has sympathy. And you have all these different words of all these things that you need to be, to be a, you know, good at X. And if you bring it all down into one component self-awareness self-awareness has allowed me to reflect on what i'm doing my capabilities my gaps and capabilities areas that i need to improve on so you know helping others be successful collaboration staying relevant but then also recognizing self-awareness i think those are the the areas that i would probably say that have helped me along in my career what advice would you have for somebody wanting to get into data or tech in the supply chain realm? I think there's, there's no, you know, if, if I'm starting a company, I could probably say, Hey, in order for me to start that company, there's a lot of, of assets that I need. It's got a high buy-in, you know, I, I have to have a lot of infrastructure or a lot of capital in order to get into this industry. But when you look at somebody who wants to get into data and wants to get into technology, there's no barrier now. There's, there's, and I think that's the great thing here is there's no barrier to get into data. There's no barrier to get into technology. You can go online now and, and spend nine hours doing self-learning in AWS and get an AWS certificate. Um, you can listen to some of your podcasts. You could listen to um, reading, uh, just reading articles uh, out there. Um, there's a lot of these six week courses now, you know, whether it's a college or it's a certification program, there's so many ways that we can get into any, anything you want to do today is, is much more open. I, I don't have a specific, like do the X, Y, and Z. Um, but what I can say, there's no more barriers to entry that there was maybe even five years ago. So one of the things I've observed about your career, and in particular the last couple of years, is a focus and maybe almost even a pivot towards artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So why the focus on AI? 
In 2004, after I, one of the things that I did when I left Kearney, um, I mentioned that I was working with a lot of startups. One of the startups I worked for was, in fact, he, he hired me after I left Kearney. That's one of the reasons why I got hired is at Kearney, I was manually manipulating data. I would take procurement data and spin data and I would manually manipulate it and cleanse it and classify it and transform it and segment it and label it and all the things that we do today that are you know, automated. Back then I'm doing it manually and I would take me nine weeks at 70 hours a week to get through just one client's data to help them understand where their spend was, their opportunity, et cetera. And there was this, um, this French engineer who had come over to, to California and he created this company based on a patented grammar-based AI spend analytics tool that would do everything that I was doing in several hours, which was completely fascinating for me to, to have to spend that much time. And then here he's creating this engine that could take the exact same amount of data I was working on or even more and be able to automate it. And so as a part of, of taking my expertise and helping develop that, that system, the the technology and rec, you know re not recognizing at the time but recognizing later um was was based on ai technology um you know deep learning machine learning and at that point in 2005 now i'm developing and writing these ai models to help build out the foundation of this database and this this you know patented application so i had experience and had um, been exposed to ai for some time and I recognized AI had a really good uh, voice within the procurement and supply chain world. But again, technology just wasn't there to be able to, to do more than what this, this, this application was doing. So it wasn't until probably three years ago when now technology has moved forward, more applications are a little bit you know AI driven. Um, and suddenly I'm able to, to revisit my passion and recognize that AI has pushed new C-suites. We have chief data officers, we have chief analytics officers, we have chief digital officers, chief transformation officers. I mean, it is, we've got the biggest C-suite now that we ever have in our lifetime as a result of these AI technologies and procurement is still there. And what I've recognized or what I observed, you know, personally, is that AI is driving all these other areas within the organization, but it's not giving enough attention to the procurement organization. And so taking, you know, bringing that voice back to, hey, I've, I've done procurement, I get it. I've, I've done the AI in procurement, I get it. We need to really help drive or, or help procurement go to the next level, you know, help help them where can how can the procurement organization evolve into the next modern day procurement organization what can we do to strip away what we've already done put on a different thinking cap think differently about our procurement organization get them more involved with the other you know c-suite officers that can really help them become what procurement should have been 10 years ago 15 years ago so yes, I am now, that's my big passion, is the impact of AI on procurement organizations, and then also the skill sets of the team members. Um, you know, there's, you know, I, I gave a, a presentation a week ago. We have more companies now that have, that ought, they say, everybody says they're doing AI. And, and I, I spoke specifically to this one supplier, and I said, oh, so you're doing AI? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, where, where in your application are you doing AI? Oh, we're using computer vision. Really? Because I'm, I'm not familiar with how computer vision through the camera can make your application work better on the website. Well, it's not really computer vision. It's, it's more like, you know, something else. Oh, well, I'm not familiar with that either. Can you explain that to me? Like, you know, oh, well, it's not really that either. It's really like more like fuzzy logic. Okay, well, now he's using the term fuzzy logic, which is even AI at all. So, you know, me going through that experience, I knew what questions to ask. But if you have um, a procurement team who's been very focused in category procurement and, and the, the traditional ways that we've been talking to suppliers, 
How are we going to know what are the right questions to ask? And on top of that, how are we going to know we're getting the right answers from these suppliers? So it's not just where the procurement organization can go, but it's, it's really focused on what are the right questions we can, should be asking as procurement professionals and even supply chain professionals, you know, neural networks and some of those supply chain um, applications. And then what should we be expecting from these suppliers? And even then, do we even have the right processes to, 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 to really process all of this? You know, I, I've, this is just a personal observation, but according to my own numbers and statistics, 40% of the suppliers that we work with, you know, this year in 2022, we'll never worked with them before because they didn't exist. And so if you're out there with these old, you know, and I'm going to say old traditional, but old, old school, you know, you know, procurement traditional, you know, processes, do we have, do we have the supply, the supplier management processes to, to support all this, all these new suppliers? Are we even including them because, you know, we thought that there was a minimum three bids and a buy that we had to, you know, comply with. So, yeah, I got really like passionate about that topic. <laughs> So you said there's a long there's a long way to go for yeah. procurement teams to actually be adopting AI. Can you share an example of a real life situation where you have seen a company do it well? <coughs> yeah, there is. Um, there's a couple different ways we look at it. So, for example, there's a, a logistics company, um, uh, Kano, C A I N A O. Kano uses AI not because they're trying to sell it to their client, but they're using the AI technology in their logistics transportation company to find the best route possible. So this is more than just your GPS. This is taking, yes, it's taking GPS data, but it's also taking real time, you know, real world data, um, mapping the route that it could, constantly adjusting the route making sure that whatever product they're doing, if they're you know, shipping glass, they certainly don't wanna go this direction. So they've used this AI technology and it's reduced, it's, they've been able to reduce their internal cost by 10% because they've had more efficient routes, they've you know, saved money on fuel. And as a result, they've been able to push that savings out to their customers. So that's, that's one, one area where AI has been used, not necessarily I'm selling you an AI software, but used internally. And, and I would say that's majority of what we're seeing. But then when you get into the procurement supply chain area, you're starting to see this year a lot more uh, predictive analytics and strategic sourcing, um, neural networks in supply chain. So for example, you've probably got an application out there that may have you know AI technology and you didn't even know it, uh, because they've been using it for quite some time, but there are some supply chain applications out there and the neural networks are on the supplier side so that not only is it predicting the and providing a confidence of, hey, that supplier you just purchased from them, you've used them in the past, yes, they haven't been able to get, get, get it to you on time, but now this is where you have the AI bringing in real-time data. Uh, there's a hurricane over here and it just so happens the supplier has materials that needs to be shipped overseas and that hurricane is going to stall them. So those are things that, yeah, I, before the predictive analytics and the neural networks, I probably could have said my supplier was going to be 80% on time based on where he was the last five times I bought from him. But now what they're doing is they're taking all, and this goes back to data, the ability to take all this data in all this historical data, retrospective data, and then all of the prospective or the current and future data that we don't have the capacity to pull together with the old and the new, stitch it together, and then be able to come up with some sort of decision. And that's where AI, which is augmenting our, our human, our, our human brain, is able to make those computations and calculations so much faster and gives us more of an accuracy in the information. So that's where we're seeing, you know, the neural networks being applied in, in some of those supply chain areas. Is there a company or something that's being built in AI today that you're most excited about for procurement in the future? Ooh, procurement in the future. 
depends on the definition of procurement. So I've been really excited about this um, AI technology in farming, which technically, you know, we are procuring. So we'll, we could talk about that one. I've been, I've been really, it's been really fascinating that we're, we're combining AI and drones together. So we're, we're taking AI technology, we're putting into drones, we're having the drones fly over crops and the, and what it's doing is it's, it's allowing farmers to know when, when is the most optimal time to harvest, but then it's also going through and highlighting more quickly, Hey, there's a disease coming in on this tree that may impact the rest of the crop, or for some reason, these apples on this tree are ripe now, but nothing else around it. And that also, you know, is is taking the computer vision, true computer vision of of the the crops that you have, and then also pulling in um, metrics from the weather and and coming back and then also looking at the crop you have. I think that's pretty amazing. Um, I, I don't know. I just I, I could I could really have a long list. I think there's just some really cool things in AI uh, recycling, um, carbon footprint. Um, I think we've got some things to do. I think we're not quite there yet in pr like procurement, like procurement software and procurement procurement software and com computer analytics. Um, I think where we're headed in in that area is you've got a lot of these large enterprise companies. And they've been building these applications out, but they're they're not ready to pull in AI and automation. And so what we see now is we see these smaller companies who have been out there solving problems with AI technology. And so as a, as a consumer, I may be working now with a large enterprise, you know, end to end kind of you know company where I can do my source to pay, but because there's gaps in some of the automation. I'm going to start applying RPA, which is the robotics, where I instead of having somebody do a you know tactical, I'm I'm like tapping my finger on the on my on my desk. Somebody who's just literally tapping the same repetitive you know keystrokes every day. We've got RPA technology or, or repetitive you know robotics being created by other companies for these applications. And then we've also got these other gaps where this particular feature is not available and the company's decided that it's not a priority. So you have another company out there who's developed an entire solution around that particular challenge and has APIs now that will connect automatically and transparently into that application. So where I'm seeing procurement and, and AI being applied is, is really this hybrid of these smaller companies using the AI technologies that are able to grow more quickly without the barriers of bureaucracy and red tape and be able to innovate more, you know, faster, and then use APIs to just plug into some of these larger companies and just resolve these, these gaps that we're seeing. So speaking of future predictions, mm -hmm. what are your observations about procurement in 2022, non AI related? And I'd love to have you highlight some notable trends. Non-AI related. Um, Non-AI related. I'd, I'd probably emphasize what I just mentioned before is we're not, we're not shifting back and forth between enterprise applications and then you know what we call best in breed or niche players where i'm going to go buy the sourcing tool from this i'm going to go buy the supply chain tool from this company i'm going to go buy the contracts tool from this company you know we we used to call that you know best in breed or or a niche player and historically we've gone from large you know, procurement applications end to end, and then we've tossed that away and we've come back and we've got the niche players and then we had to stitch them together with, you know, integrations. And then we kind of tossed that away. And, you know, the last five, six years, we've gone back to those bigger, you know, bigger players. But what I don't see is us rotating back to the best in breed. What I do see is I think what I highlighted before, it's I don't need to do best in breed because I've got now all these APIs that can connect the data, you know, from different applications. So I can get a supplier risk module from a company that I really like, 
And it's okay if I don't have all the data there because I can get APIs that can pull in the right, you know, supplier risks data around sustainability, which I'm very, you know, passionate about. Or I need to pull in financial data from DNB, and I can get an API that pulls that in. Um, we're not going to see, in my opinion, we're not going to see these best of breeds because in order for a company to have a best in breed for just supplier risk, they would have to probably go buy five or six other companies just to be best in breed for supplier risk that's really good. So I would say where we're trending is, yeah, we're still going to have those enterprise applications, the source to pay, but now we're just going to you know, do APIs to, to have other companies come in and fill a gap or have an API that pulls in you know, sustainability information um, around suppliers and materials. That's, that's, I think, something that's not directly AI related, but I, I see that as a trend going forward. One of the things that I know people struggle with is deciding, should I hire more people and build out my team internally to work on some of these new initiatives that you just talked about? Or should I leverage and work with consultants? You've mm. been in both roles. You've been mm. in procurement. You've run procurement teams. You've also have extensive consulting experiment experience. What advice do you give for people debating or, or trying to figure out this strategy? Where I have found consulting works really well is I have a, a so I, I, let's say I'm, I'm in procurement. I have a, a really great team. Um, I need to get their expertise to a certain place. And I'm going to do that cost benefit analysis. So let's, you know, put our procurement hat on. I'm going to do that cost benefit analysis. And I recognize in order to get them there, um, it would cost me X amount of money or it would take X amount of time. And, and time is money. And time is, is really the factor that, that I tend to look at the most. So if I need to get my team ramped up, yes, let me, let me answer this one first before I go back to hiring more people. I would bring a consultant in to help build the foundational components of what I need, but then I would turn that over and use that as an opportunity to educate my team. So in other words, I don't need my team to build it. I just need my team to understand it, be able to learn from it, maintain it, innovate on it, build upon it, make it better. Um, so a consulting company, whoever it is, small or big, they're really good to come in and help build the foundation so that my team does, because my team's got tons of other things to do. Like they've got to go take some AI, you know, classes, <laughs> you know, they got, they got to go, uh, you know, they got to go have that, that other consultant I have coming in doing like a four day workshop on what exactly is AI and what kind of things do you need to learn? Um, but, um, but if I'm looking to build something, I'll, I'll have that consulting group come in and build it. Now with regard to, you know, hire people, Yes, I'm still going to have to hire and, and expand. I, I hope I'm going to have to expand because even, even with technology, we recognize that we still need a diverse set of, of thought. And, and diversity of thought means I want a, a variety of individuals that I have in my team. Um, and then I need to balance that with, okay, am I just hiring people because I have a lot of manual work that's being done. I, and it's funny, you, I, you're laughing and nodding, but th there's actually a real world story here. Um, last year I spoke to somebody and I said, hey, do you have like a supplier management you know, group? Do you have a supplier management process? And the reply was, oh, you know, we are thinking about building one. We haven't had a formal program yet. So we're going to go hire 30 people, put them in, in Latin America, and then just have them do supplier data entry. Okay, that's not a supplier management program, um, nor should it be, and nor would I hope that anybody would come back with an answer and say, I'm going to hire 30 people to do that. So when I think about hiring people, I want to balance, am I, what am I hiring them for? If I'm hiring them to do a lot of manual data work, then I need to step back first and fix the automation issue 
before I go back and, and hire those individuals. So that's how I balance when's the right time to have the consultant come in, uh, either build the foundation or come in and, and educate, you know, based on what's going on in the market. And then also balancing the, um, Am I, hi what, am I hiring because I just need more people to do manual work or I need to fix that and then hire for the right reasons? Yeah. So you launched a podcast. Mm -hmm. I did. Would like to know what inspired, what was the inspiration behind the launch? And then would like to have you share what is the podcast about? So I, I, um, and I, and I think you can relate to this earlier last year, I was wanting, I, I found this really great LinkedIn panel based on a topic that I was really interested in. It was around blockchain and procurement and I'm like, great, this is fabulous. And I, you know, they seem to be having a conversation and I put a question out there and said, Look, I recognize that blockchain and contracts has been a topic that we've all discussed. Where is the next thing in procurement related to blockchain? Like what's blockchain going to do next for procurement? And this was four guys and they spent 22 minutes because I, I counted answering the question blockchain and contracts. That wasn't my question. I wanted to know they were being they were being um, led as having expertise in blockchain. So I wanted to know, well, what's next? And what I found very frustrating by this was they all, I felt like I was listening to four guys drinking a beer and talking about blockchain and contracts. And I apologize for that, but this is probably just the one LinkedIn event I happened to go to. And I was very frustrated with that. And I said, where are the women? Where Where's the rest of the women in this topic? You know. And I said, you know, this is, I'm going to fix this. So I went out and I interviewed and became associate editor for AI Time Journal with the sole purpose of writing articles about women in, in technology. And they approached me and said, would you be willing to host a podcast? Oh my gosh. Like, I know Sarah does podcasts. I've never done a podcast. I don't even know, like, I'm going to have to come up with questions. Like, how does she do it? You know, how does, how does Sarah do this? And I, I came back and said, I'll only do it if I could interview 99% women. And I didn't think that they would accept that. And no hesitation. Absolutely. 99% women. So the podcast is Impact of AI. And I, I for the past year and a half, I've interviewed 99% women. And it's all about how AI is impacting us on a daily basis, whether it's professionally or personally. So sometimes I'm out there interviewing chief data officers, CIOs who now have data and AI that roll up into them. Um, I've been fortunate enough to, to talk to some startups like the farming startup and this uh, recycling startup. Um, I've, I've just been very fortunate and majority of the, the women that I interview are women that I find on LinkedIn. Um, they rarely come and raise their hand and say interview me it's really me going out there and i one one in particular i a woman on linkedin who i'm going to interview in in a week from now um she's an advocate for the supreme court of india and she just got a certification for ai auditing in the country of india and that just i mean first of all a lawyer but she went and got certified as an AI auditor. And in the US, we don't even have AI auditors. The concept hasn't even, even been talked about yet. So not only am I fortunate to have these, this experience with these wonderful women, but because it's global, you know, because of COVID and the globality has opened up and everything's virtual, I'm meeting women that are doing some fascinating things with AI. Um, a woman in Uruguay, um, she should be, uh, published just recently, she combined neuroscience with AI and you put a cap on, you put it on your head and it takes your brain waves and it creates a unique piece of art, both sound and light. So if I put the hat on, my brain waves would create a completely unique individual art installation that's different from Sarah's and different from, you know, Martha's and different from, you know, somebody else. 
that's just awesome. And I never would have known about any of this stuff if I hadn't had the, the fortunate opportunity of, of being this, this, this podcast host, which I'm sure you feel when you talk to people too, but yeah. If people want to get more info on the podcast, what website or, or where mm -hmm. should they go? So it's, it's under AI time journal. Uh, there's AI time journal similar to you. They do audio video. So they have a YouTube channel, AI Time Journal, and then they push their podcast, audio podcast, out to everything. Um, you know, the most common ones, uh, what Spotify and Apple, but then they push it to all the other uh, podcasts that are that are out there globally. So we've talked a lot about your career. In our last ten minutes, I want to get a little more personal and and give some advice that I think can be relatable to most people that listen to the show. How do you manage being a wife, a mom, and a businesswoman? I don't. I, 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 um, I used to think that I was balancing it. I used to really think that I had it done really well, that I was juggling and keeping all the balls in the air. And I no. I just recently I've realized that I've never been able to do it at all. Um, I I think about it differently now. It's not keeping all the balls in the air and sometimes they drop. It's I think about them as a series of scales. You know, I have my personal scale and my work scale and my family scale, and I have. Um, pebbles that are on each of these scales. And I have to sometimes say no and take things off my personal scale or my work scale. Um, sometimes priorities shift. You know, there could be health, you know, family health issues that need suddenly a shift in priority. And so this, the scales change um, and they rotate based on where I'm needed. Um, I've also recognized that, you know, I, I have twins, but everybody in my everybody needs a different type of attention a different level of attention um i need a different level of attention and a different type of attention and a you know personal time which i haven't been really focused on a lot in my career so yeah i i wish i could say that there's this great technique that i've done that works but i think realistically if I'm honest with myself, I've I've never truly been able to balance it. And ultimately, I think that's probably the right thing to say. It, it's really more about shifting, prioritizing, saying no, saying yes, and really what's important. Any other tips you have? You mentioned a couple for those struggling with time management. Yeah, <laughs> that's, I think everybody struggles with that. You know, I actually took one of those Fred Pryor seminars uh, about 15 years ago. You know, you go on a Saturday, it's like an all day Saturday thing. And it talks about time management It gets you techniques and things that you learn. Um, and that works when you have a finite set of, of activities and tasks that works really well. But what time management doesn't address is all the new things that come in and where they come in at. And, you know, this individual, you know, your chief procurement officer, he needs something, but he needs it in his particular way. And your, your husband's sister-in-law may have had a, you know, some kind of family health emergency. And now you've got to, you know, watch the dog for a week. Okay. That wasn't in the plan. And I, I think what I've learned over time is, you have to be a you have to be a sturdy tree, but you have to be able to bend. I think the willow. I, I try to figure out which tree it is, but I think the, the willow is the one that's really really sturdy and doesn't blow over when it rains, but it bends in the rain. So that's like my my you know yeah. Um, but but for me, it's it's making a list of of what needs to be done, and sometimes I'm making a list you know for that day. Um, it's recognizing. And, and I do have a very analytical perspective to it, but it, it's prioritizing, it's recognizing how long each one of those things is gonna take. I do like to shift some some quick wins at the very beginning because I'm, I love having a sense of accomplishment. So sometimes I'll purposely put a really simple task at the front just to make me feel like I've actually accomplished something for that day, which makes me feel good. 
So that's another variable is I need to feel good about my day. Um, and, and I think the most important thing is sometimes you just have to push back and say no. And as long as you understand that and you're managing and setting that expectation with others, I've learned through my career that if I say something right away, I can't do that today, but I can get to it on Tuesday or I can get to it next week. Most often, nobody has an issue with that. And I think that was some of the valuable lessons I learned is don't don't think that they want you to do it right away. They're willing to to negotiate with you. You just need to let them know that. And I think that was my I think it's my, my biggest lesson learned. So in our last five minutes, I do a spitfire round. I'm going to ask you a question and then answer with the first word or phrase that comes to mind. Oh, my. <laughs> Accomplishment you are most proud of. Oh, my kids. Quality you admire most in yourself. Adaptability. What's your dream? Retirement. <laughs> Biggest pet peeve? Oh my God, I have a lot of them. <laughs> my biggest pet peeve. Stuff, clutter. I do not like, oh, I do not like clutter. Absolutely, I do not like clutter. <laughs> Favorite thing to do in your downtime? Ah, uh, well, I, did I mention I have two kids? Sleeping is often really a good thing to do in my downtime, but I'm also trying to write a book. So lately I've been trying to work on that. <laughs> Any sneak previews you're willing to share about your book? Oh, these were supposed to be one word answers, weren't they? Oops, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I love this, this is great. It's the most fun I've had. So this is like the most fun. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, sneak previews, uh, book will be out this summer. Um, I have a publisher, it's Ross Publications. And um, it's really the first step in a series on what we've talked about earlier, how the procurement can move into the modern day procurement organization. Um, what do you need to do to get all that clutter and, and all that stuff out of the way so that you can grow into what we need you to, what we, what I, what we all want you to be um, when you grow up. <laughs> well, Melissa, I wanna thank you very much for coming on the show today. For those that would like to connect with you, maybe continue the conversation, where would you like to direct them? LinkedIn. And I am 100% advocate in sharing knowledge. That's the whole point of, of what we're doing here is sharing knowledge. Um, nobody out there should feel like they have to do this from scratch. There's too many people out there that have done this before that we can get lessons learned from. So LinkedIn, open book. Mm -hmm. All right. So thanks again, Melissa, for coming on the show. Join me again next month. We're changing up our schedule a bit. So it's actually our next show is going to be on May 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.